This is a Reconstructionist radio production. Please visit garynorth.com forward slash free books to download this book on PDF. The title of this book is Westminster's Confession, The Abandonment of Van Til's Legacy by Gary North, Institute for Christian Economics, Tyler, Texas, copyright Gary North, 1991. Chapter 5. The Question of Law Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 13.10 Quote, Love is without question the fulfilling of the law. It might be more accurate to say that love is the fulfillment of the law. It will surely not be challenged if we say that love is both emotive and motive. Love is feeling and it impels to action. If it does not impel to the fulfillment of the law, it is not the love of which the scripture here speaks. In a word, the action to which love impels is the action which is characterized as the fulfillment of the law. End quote. John Murray, 1957. Which law does love fulfill? This is the question that has divided Christian ethicists from the beginning. For the last three centuries, however, Protestants have refused to acknowledge the existence of this unsolved problem. With the demise around 1700 of the judicial art of casuistry, Christian theologians have not worked to develop specifically Christian applications of permanent moral standards to real-world problems, especially social problems. Today, with modern society for the first time since the flood facing a universal worldwide crisis, the whole world needs answers. So far, very few Christians are even asking the questions. 20th century Calvinism, like 20th century evangelicalism in general, is immersed in this worldwide moral and judicial crisis. It is more than just a financial and cultural crisis. It is a theological crisis. Theonomy, a reformed critique, is evidence of this crisis within Calvinism, not because it opposes a particular subset of reformed theology called theonomy, but because the men who wrote it self-consciously refuse to suggest any equally comprehensive judicial alternative. Nevertheless, there are always alternatives lurking in the shadows, covenant-breaking alternatives. There are no judicial vacuums in this covenantal world. There could be no judicial neutrality any more than there can be moral neutrality. The theological problem for the Christian ethicist is that these judicial alternatives today are all self-consciously non-Christian. Their defenders were not always equally self-conscious. For centuries, the principles of natural law were assumed to be morally neutral and common to mankind as a rational species. Newton's laws of physics were the model. No one, however, who proclaims intellectual allegiance to Charles Darwin, Werner Heisenberg, or Cornelius Van Til can consistently believe such a thing today. Natural law theory was always an illusion, whether in its medieval form, realism, or its modern form, nominalism. Therefore, today's contemporary theological crisis has been brewing for well over three centuries. It began during the Puritan Revolt in England, 1640-60. to The Presbyterians and the Independents did not agree on the question of church hierarchy. The Levellers did not agree with the first two groups on political hierarchy. They were Democrats who rejected the idea of religious or economic restrictions on the right to vote. The Diggers did not agree with the first three on economic hierarchy. They were communists. These issues were not settled during Cromwell's era. Then Charles II returned to the throne, and the Calvinists were driven out, out of Oxford and Cambridge, out of political office, and out of the pulpits of the land. Only a few pietistic Calvinists were willing to sign the Act of Uniformity, 1662, in order to retain their positions. Men like William Gurnall, whose Christian in complete armor is a gigantic exercise in pietistic introspection, a manual of personal reform to the exclusion of social reform. This culturally retreatist outlook is inherent in all pietism, the, de- the denial of any ethically necessary connection between the individual's regeneration and society's transformation. The Pietist Unitarian Alliance Pietism is the worldview of both Christian individualism 
and the closed small society, for example, the Amish. Anglo-American pietism has for over three centuries been in an alliance with political Unitarianism. Both proclaim the legitimate autonomy of politics from the judicial claims of the Bible. The triumph of Locke's Whig political vision in 1690, developed during his stay in the Netherlands in the early 1680s, was an extension of the Unitarian theology and social views of Isaac Newton, not the Calvinism of Oliver Cromwell. American Presbyterianism is a product of the confessional revision of 1788. That revision was grounded in the worldview of Newtonianism. A year after the 1788 Synod, in May of 1789, the General Assembly had Reverend John Witherspoon chair a committee to prepare an address to the newly elected President of the United States. The committee drafted a lengthy report in which it expressed those sentiments that have been passed down from textbook to textbook, echoing Washington's familiar Masonic rhetoric regarding the social utility of religion in general. The address announced, quote, Public virtue is the most certain means of public felicity, and religion is the surest basis of virtue. We therefore esteem it a peculiar happiness to behold in our chief magistrate a steady, uniform, avowed friend of the Christian religion, and who on the most public and solemn occasions devoutly acknowledges the government of divine providence. End quote. The address then identified the role of the newly reformed Presbyterian Church in the American political religion. Quote, we shall consider ourselves as doing an acceptable service to God in our profession when we contribute to render men sober, honest, and industrious citizens and the obedient subjects of a lawful government. End quote. Here was a new vision, the church as cheerleader. Presbyterianism, like Protestantism generally, remains politically Newtonian, for it is still silent regarding the biblical requirements of the civil government. This theological silence on civil affairs is the essence of Whig political theory. It is the foundation of the American civil religion. Princeton Theological Seminary, like the Log College, and the subsequent College of New Jersey, was Whig from its inception. The presupposition of such an outlook is the acceptance of natural law theory. The faculty at Princeton Seminary adopted the common-sense rationalist tradition of Scottish Presbyterian apologetics. This tradition was abandoned by Van Til but it was never self-consciously abandoned by the faculty of Westminster Seminary. The implications of this epistemological schizophrenia are still being worked out. The trouble is, they are not being worked out systematically and self-consciously. If anything, these implications are being avoided. The Revolt Against Old Princeton A revolt took place at Princeton Seminary in 1929 when the liberals and the stand patters took control of the board of directors at Princeton. Four conservative professors left, Alice, Machen, Wilson, and Van Til. This revolt was a two-pronged revolt, however, a fact that has never been discussed in detail by the heirs of that schism. The old Princeton tra tradition, pre-1929, did not survive. Both its eschatology, post-millennial, and its apologetic tradition, common-sense rationalism, were abandoned by its two successors. The successors at Princeton went Barthian. The successors at Westminster went Dutch. Van Til was the key to Westminster's abandonment of the Princetonian apologetic tradition. He was a presuppositionalist. He broke from all previous Christian apologetic traditions in his radical abandonment of the idea of natural law in any form. At Princeton Seminary, he had earned a THM at Princeton University. He had earned a PhD under A. A. Bauman. One of his two graduate student compatriots with Bauman was Philip Wheelwright, who later distinguished himself as an expert of Heraclitus. With these as rock-solid academic credentials, Van Til had been appointed to the chair of apologetics at Princeton Seminary for the 1928-29 academic year, the equivalent of full professor. In the summer of 1929, just before the Great Depression began, Princeton Seminary split the Bible-believing conservatives left to form Westminster Seminary. That summer, Van Til left Princeton and went into the pastorate in Michigan. J. Gresham Machen appealed to him repeatedly throughout the summer to come teach apologetics at Westminster, but Van Til rejected the call. Then, as the academic term opened, 
he relented and joined the faculty in Philadelphia. Machen understood that the new seminary needed a program in apologetics. He had defended the faith himself with academic rigor in the origin of Paul's religion and the virgin birth of Christ. Machen either accepted the old Princeton's rationalist apologetic, or at least he never public, publicly rejected it. Van Til had already broken with that tradition. Machen hired him. William White asks, quote, Did Machen understand how far from the old Princeton apologetic the new Westminster apologetic really was? Did Machen realize that Van Til, R.B. Kuyper, and Ned Stonehouse had brought to Philadelphia the best of Amsterdam? Had the thought actually registered that a new direction in apologetics in America was being chartered? Years later, Van Til was not sure, White says. It is a known fact that Machen, as far as he comprehended it, fully endorsed Van Til's thinking and gave it his hearty and unqualified backing, end quote. R.B. Kuyper, Homiletics, and Ned B. Stonehouse, New Testament, never wrote on apologetics. What they brought was another aspect of Amsterdam, amillennial eschatology. Van Til rarely, as far as I know, never, mentioned the word eschatology in his writings, nor did Edward J. Young, Old Testament, emphasize it. But both men were amillennialists. It is assumed in their writings, which is why Van Til's view of common grace in history was governed by the vision of a coming era of increasing persecution for the church. So while Westminster and its graduates have always liked to refer to themselves as heirs of the old Princeton, the claim was never valid. To understand this, we need to apply the Bible's five-point covenant model. With respect to Tulip, point one of the biblical covenant model, God's absolute sovereignty, Westminster was a legitimate heir of Princeton. Westminster was Calvinistic. With respect to point two, hierarchy, it was also Princetonian, for example, Presbyterian. With respect to point three, law, it was never made clear that, it, that a definitive break had been made from natural law theory to Van Til never made clear what he was substituting for natural law. His was an exclusively negative judicial confession. This lack of clarity on the question of civil justice is at the heart of today's debate over theonomy. Point four, sanctions, was also a major transition from the traditional Princetonian hope and God's blessings on the church in history to a view that predicated escalating cursings. Finally, eschatology. Westminster abandoned Princeton's traditional postmillennialism, the eschatology of answer 191 of the larger catechism. So in three crucial respects, law, sanctions, and eschatology, Westminster Seminary became a Dutch enclave within American Presbyterianism. The old Princeton really did perish in 1929. It left no heirs, either theologically or institutionally. Today's Calvinistic postmillennialists are virtually all Vantillian in their apologetics, the Christian Reconstructionists. Yet on the question of law, the Theonomists are neither Vantillian nor Princetonian. They are Neo-Puritan. Two Views of the State Francis Schaeffer asked, how should we then live? This is the question. He never provided an answer. Neither has any theological seminary since the demise of Princeton. If there is a gaping hole in the curriculum of every Bible-believing theological seminary today, it is ethics. Social ethics is part of biblical ethics, and this is the topic that theologically conservative seminaries' faculties will do anything to avoid. The moment they begin to speak of social ethics in the name of the Bible, the school's finances are threatened. There are too many shades of social, economic, and political opinion within any school's donor base. Nevertheless, social ethics and personal ethics are inextricably linked. The social gospel's advocates recognized this fact early, and by addressing it forthrightly, stole the hearts and minds of at least three generations of Christian students. Liberation theology until the public demise of Marxism in late 1989 successfully carried forward this tradition. The conservative seminaries, including Westminster, Covenant, and Reformed, remained institutionally silent on social ethics. They had to. Scottish common sense rationalism offered no Bible-based alternative. Neither did Abraham Kuyper's Calvinism. Kuyper's legacy, the state as a healer. 
Abraham Kuyper's longest lasting political legacy to the Netherlands as Prime Minister, 1901 to 1905, was his Higher Education School Finance Law of 1905. It involved national state subsidies to the gymnasia, the academic high schools. It also established state funded technical institutes. It forced the state to grant equal legal status to all university degrees, an indirect but important subsidy to Kuyper's own Free University of Amsterdam, which had been the only private university in the Netherlands from 1880 to 1903. Quote, to the Free University, the law was a priceless boon, a silver anniversary gift of inestimable value, one which had stood at the head of its gift list for years, end quote, writes Kuyper's biographer. Indeed it was. It led to the liberalization of the school, and in such a way that its Christian victims never perceived the shift. Quote, now the school could really exist and grow and flourish. Indeed, the free university faced a bright and shining future. End quote. Claus Schilder was to learn better a generation later. This subsidy destroyed the theological moorings of the free university and then Kuiper's denomination. Kuiper never sensed the inescapable danger. This transformation was guaranteed from 1905. The money and the monopoly grant of power, degree granting, inevitably corrupted the free university. Here is the great and predictable irony. Quote, Kuiper's ultimate goal was none other than the liberation of higher education from the state and its return to the people. End quote. The result, of course, was exactly the opposite. The source of the funding, in this case, coercively confiscated tax revenues, always determines the standards and character of the recipient institutions. The non-public universities had to meet the standards of the state. These standards were supposedly religiously neutral. In fact, nothing is religiously neutral. What Kuiper should have demanded was the removal of all state sanctions from education, money, examinations, and supervision of academic degrees. But such a view is radical even today, despite a century of public school tyranny and declining standards, let alone in 1905. Instead, he sought state subsidies. This infusion of money and monopoly degree granting authority led, decade by decade, to the destruction of Christian education in the Netherlands. The Dutch Catholics, by the 1960s, had become the Roman Church's most flaming national pocket of radicals, while the confession affirming Calvinists have continued to shrink in influence, going along with Dutch socialism with only mild and half hearted protests. Kuiper had supported social welfare legislation from the beginning. Government money, like free cocaine, produced the predictable results, the creation of dependency on the part of the Christians. With that stolen money came a humanist worldview. What the Free University of Amsterdam steadily became was the kind of university that Kuiper had worked so hard to replace a century earlier. Then he did to the elementary schools what he did to higher education. He got a law passed that subsidized the non-public elementary schools. Quote, Moreover, the new law brought the non-public school teachers into the pension system which existed for their colleagues in the state schools and gave them the same legal status, end quote. The previous prime minister had rammed through a compulsory school attendance law, passed 50 to 49 in the second chamber, when two defectors from the political rights coalition voted with the socialists and liberals. Kuiper did not seek to repeal that law. He was in favor of compulsory school attendance laws so he persuaded the Christians to get their hands into the government's till. It took very little persuading. The idea of school vouchers is popular among private schools today, another attempted grab for state money, despite the fact that the federal government took over private higher education in the U.S. by means of federal student aid grants, the famous Grove City College case. They never seem to learn. Take the state's nickel and you take its noose. How does Kuiper's biographer describe this political triumph? Quote, the law's provisions showed that the government was in dead earnest in its concern for the moral interests of the nation, end quote. to which he adds, quote, and further, Kuiper's liquor law was a salutary law. Its effect, combined with the efforts of total abstinence and temperance groups, appreciably reduced the consumption of alcoholic beverages in Holland, end quote. Machen's Legacy the state as spoiler. Machen was a 19th century political liberal. This was the old Princeton tradition. 
he did not trust the state. He testified to the U.S. Congress against the creation of a federal Department of Education. He specifically identified his opposition to the proposed 1926 education bill as paralleling his opposition to the attempted child labor amendment to the Constitution. Machen understood what federal money inescapably would mean, the unwarranted expansion of federal power. He warned the congressman that, quote, money given for education, no matter what people say, always has a string tied to it that appears in gifts of money by private foundations, and it appears far more, of course, when the gift comes from the federal government, end quote. Machen continued, quote, It is to be opposed, we think, because it represents a tendency which is no new thing, but has been in the world for at least 2,300 years, which seems to be opposed to the whole principle of liberty for which our country stands. It is the notion that education is the affair essentially of the state, that the children of the state must be educated for the benefit of the state, that idiosyncrasies should be avoided, and the state should devise that method of education which will best promote the welfare of the state. That principle was put in classic form in ancient Greece in the Republic of Plato. It was put into operation with very disastrous results in some of the Greek states. It has been in the world ever since as the chief enemy of human liberty. It appears in the world today. End quote. In his cross-examination session by members of the committee, he observed, prophetically, it has turned out, quote, I think we are having today a very marked intellectual as well as moral decline through the gradual extension of standardization in education, end quote. What is really interesting is that one proponent of the bill kept pressing Machen to admit that the Bureau of Education had done some good things in administering the schools in West Washington, D.C., Machen did not take the bait. Today, there are few, if any, congressmen who send their children into the hell holes of the Washington, D.C. public school system. One of the senators asked him a perceptive question. It is the educational question of questions in the United States. It has been the question ever since the decision of the Puritans in Massachusetts to pass a compulsory school attendance law in 1642, a precedent used by Horace Mann two centuries later to make America a Unitarian nation. Quote, I am just wondering whether there is any such thing as moral conduct in the United States Congress or among the citizens of the United States apart from a distinctly religious basis. I am just wondering whether the public schools have any function in the way of teaching morality which is not distinctively religious in its basic idea. End quote. Here is Machen's reply. Quote, I myself do not believe that you can have such a morality permanently, and that is exactly what I am interested in trying to get other people to believe. But I am not at all interested in trying to proclaim that view of mine by any measures that involve compulsion, and I am not interested in making the public school an agency for the proclamation of such a view. But I am interested in diminishing rather than increasing the function of the public school, in order to leave room for the opportunity of a propagation of the view that I hold in free conflict with all other views which may be held, in order that in that way the truth finally may prevail. End quote. Here Machen laid down the gauntlet, the need for a drastic reduction in the influence of government funded education. The theonomists walked down this path to its logical conclusion no public education, no compulsory education laws either, no interference with the God given assignment of the education of children by the family or its authorized agents. But there is a war going on against the family and its authority, sometimes by the church and sometimes by the state. The locus of authority is blurred. This weakens the will of Christian parents to fight. So much for Machen's view of federal aid to education. His view was antithetical to everything Kuyper believed. What was Machen's view of prohibition? He was opposed to it. He was consistent. He did not believe that the federal government had any jurisdiction over the consumption of alcohol. This stand got him in trouble with the fundamentalists. Prohibition was the last crusade of the fundamentalists, who achieved their political goal through an alliance with theological liberals and humanistic political progressives. In short, Machen, the social theorist, was the antithesis of Abraham Kuyper, the politician. Kuyper believed in common grace. In his system, this became a theory of epistemological common ground. Machen did not explicitly oppose common-sense rationalism. This also had long served as a epistemological common ground. 
Van Til rejected all forms of common ground philosophy. He also did not accept theonomy. His successors at Westminster formally proclaim allegiance to Van Til. Where does this leave Westminster Seminary? Drifting along, going with the flow, waiting for the parousia, condemning biblical law, denying Christendom. Blackout at Westminster At Westminster Seminary, none of this Presbyterian history is ever publicly discussed. Students are not warned that in order to hold Kuiper's view of society, it is necessary to reject Machen's and vice versa. Machen's views in society and economics are never discussed. Worse, the students have been deliberately misled about his views. Consider the 1977 book on Machen by faculty member and church historian Paul Woolley. The Significance of J. Gratian Machen Today In this brief and misleading, quote, biography, end quote, of Machen, nothing of Machen's political views is mentioned. Half the 84-page book is devoted to promoting Woolley's liberal political beliefs, women's liberation, labor unions, and abortion. As I said in my review of the book, quote, the book might better be titled, The Significance of the Opinions of Paul Woolley, Using Machen's Name as a Sales Device, end quote. The book was a fraud, a piece of unconscionable propaganda, but I was the only person to say so in print. The old boy network at Westminster closed ranks around the aging Woolley. He should have been fired years before because of his pro-abortion stance. He should have been fired decades before because of his lousy lecturing, both in terms of content, no explicit framework, little attention to creeds, no meaningful conclusions, no discussion of the relevance of Christianity for Western civilization, few lessons from the past, and his endless nervous coughing. He was among the very worst lecturers on history I have ever heard. And I heard a career full. He would have made a superb librarian or bibliographer, not to mention a railway clerk. He missed his calling. I ended the review with this statement, which I think is still appropriate today. Quote, it is indicative of the state of the seminary today that Mr. Woolley never hesitated to state his opinions frankly on campus, while the politically conservative faculty members at Westminster Seminary, such as Dr. Van Til and John Murray, chose to keep their political views hidden, sticking to exegesis and their academic disciplines. The liberals used the classroom for their purposes, and the conservatives used the classroom for theirs. Unfortunately, the classroom goals of the conservatives have been far too limited to promote an effective, long-range program of Christian reconstruction. The liberals win by default. That is the significance, not of J. Gresham Machen, but of his orthodox followers who share his outspoken political beliefs, but who do not speak out as he did. End quote. There are other related aspects of Westminster's history that have been blacked out. It is time to let our light shine on them. Abandoning Machen's Legacy, Stage 1 R. B. Kuyper was Professor of Systematic Theology at Westminster the first year, 1929-30. He left for three years to become president of Calvin College, 1930-33. to He returned to become professor of practical theology at Westminster in 1933, a position he held for two decades. He ended his career as president of Calvin Seminary, 1953-56. to When Machen died, Kuyper was made chairman of the Westminster faculty. Less than three years after Machen's death, Kuyper brought the cultural worldview of this new Amsterdam before the readers of the Westminster Theological Journal. This essay is representative of the modified Kuyperian views of conservative Dutch Calvinism. It was titled, quote, The Christian Pulpit and Social Problems, end quote. Like all of Dutch social apologetics, this essay stated clearly what it was against and was distressingly vague about what it was for. The essay is 33 pages long. Kuyper spent nine pages attacking, quote, the social gospel of liberalism, end quote. He spent eight and a half pages refuting, quote, the individual gospel of dispensationalism, end quote. He spent seven pages on, quote, the quietistic gospel of Barthianism, end quote. The final eight and a half pages were devoted to, quote, the comprehensive gospel of Calvinism, end quote. 
First, he praised Calvin's work to create, quote, a reformation of public morals in the city of Geneva, end quote. Second, he praised Abraham Kuyper's Calvinism, quote, Today Holland boasts numerous institutions of Christian mercy, an influential Christian labor alliance, and a reformed university with high scholastic standards and a strong Calvinistic political party, end quote. This defense of Calvin and Kuyper took one whole paragraph. Already, Kuyper felt the pressure of modern pietism. Quote, too much, too much, end quote. He could hear the fundamentalist critics crying, quote, Calvinism is all social gospel, exclamation point, end quote. Kuyper immediately went on the defensive. Quote, not for a moment may the thought he be harbored that Reformed preaching stresses the social teaching of the Bible, at the expense of its message of individual redemption. Hardly anything could be farther removed from the truth. The charge so often laid at the door of Calvinism that it does not show sufficient interest in the salvation of souls is utterly false, end quote. He then linked the salvation of society directly to the salvation of souls, a perfectly biblical perspective, quote, Of all men, no one is more firmly convinced than the Calvinist that there can be no such thing as the salvation of society apart from the salvation of the individuals constituting society, end quote. This raises a crucial millennial question. If there will never be widespread conversion of souls, can there ever be, in Kuyper's words, quote, the salvation of society, end quote? Kuyper was well aware that post-millennialists would ask that question. There were still a few of them around, though not on the faculty in 1939. As an amillennialist, he steadfastly refused to answer this question directly. His spiritual heirs would answer it five decades later. Instead, he went from the question of the possibility of society's salvation to the motivation of Christians to work toward it. In short, he individualized his social message. Quote, the question how effective his message will prove does not trouble the Reformed preacher out of measure. What concerns him is that he has marching orders. Most assuredly, he prays with all the fervor at his command that God the Holy Spirit may cause the seed of the word to bring forth fruit a hundredfold. He is also confident that his labors will not be in vain in the Lord. But he does not need the postmillennial view of the future to sustain him in his work. Likely, a minority of Reformed preachers today take the position that through the preaching of the gospel the kingdom will be brought to per- perfection. End quote. Notice the final phrase, quote, Through the preaching of the gospel, the kingdom will be brought to perfection, end quote. Here, Kuyper resorted to that familiar, amillennial, rhetorical trick, read, lie of attributing to one's postmillennial opponents a prediction of a future earthly perfectionism that none of them has ever asserted, and that postmillennialist B.B. Warfield specifically identified as heretical. Kuyper knew He had studied at Princeton under Warfield. Without this rhetorical trick, among several others, the amillennial view of the Church's future is easily identified as pessimistic. Calvinist amillennialists, therefore, have have felt compelled to invent a completely mythological postmillennial utopianism in order to make their culturally defeatist position look realistic. In short, they lie. To build Jesus' spiritual kingdom, of course. This deliberate misrepresentation by all millennial theologians does annoy us postmillennialists, but we have had no way until recently to answer our critics. They control Calvinism's academic journals. They have indulged in their misrepresentation of, quote, postmillennial perfectionism, end quote, for so long that they probably do not even think twice about it. Quote, postmillennialism equals perfectionism equals utopianism, end quote is a single equation in their thinking. No matter, they are stating a falsehood that they will admit under cross-examination is a falsehood. But then they go on writing about, quote, post-millennial perfectionism, end quote, because it is traditional in amillennial circles to do so. And those post-millennialists who use the word liars to describe them are considered a terribly gauch. So they are afraid to use it. I am not. R.B. Kuyper lied. He waited until Machen was dead to go into print with this nonsense. He knew that amillennialists had inherited Machen's seminary 
and there was nothing any post-millennialist could do about it. Other than writing from off-campus, there still isn't. What will the church face in the future, according to Kuiper? Cultural defeat. He said emphatically that, quote, when the present dual process of the evangelization of non-Christian peoples and the development of the forces of evil shall have run its course, the victory to all appearances will be on the side of the price of darkness, end quote. He could not have made it any plainer. Only a radical discontinuity from beyond history that ends history will at last, at the last, bring victory. Quote, However, with catastrophic suddenness, Christ will appear in person, destroy Satan and his domain, and upon its ruins perfect his own everlasting kingdom. End quote. Then he admitted the obvious, when he specifically identified as obvious, quote, Those who take this view are obviously much less optimistic about the immediate results of the presentation of the social teaching of the gospel than are their postmillenarian brethren. End quote. Notice his use of the word immediate. By this word, he really means in all of history. But he did not have the courage to say this plainly. He then went on to defend the not-so-obvious regarding amillennial preachers of social salvation. Quote, but let no one think that they are, for that reason, less zealous for their task. End quote. Kuyper said that the preacher must, quote, deal with social problems in the pulpit because it is his duty to preach the whole world, word. End quote. Fine. This brings us to the question, what does the Bible teach about society? Here, he grew vague. He was not ready to affirm in Christ's name the late 19th century political liberalism that Machen had espoused. After all, Kuiper was Kuiperian. But he did insist that Christian preachers must go to the Bible, including the law, to discover these great social principles. Quote, the Reformed preacher brings a social message because he finds such a message in God's word. He finds it in the preaching of the prophets, the baptizer, Jesus, and his apostles, but also in many portions of scripture which are not themselves sermons. He finds it here and there and everywhere in scripture. Determined, as he is to declare the whole counsel of God, he cannot keep silent. End quote. Would he take the leap? Would he say it? Would he say those crucial words, Mosaic law? Not quite. He drew up to the edge of the chasm, but he would not leap. He did say this, however, quote, The Calvinist sees in the Bible both law and gospel. The two are interwoven. To distinguish between them is not only valid, but highly necessary. Yet to separate them is to do violence to holy writ. The Old Testament contains both law and gospel. The New Testament contains both gospel and law. Both gospel and law are intended for all men. End quote. Whoa, there, R.B., for all men? Is that what you said? You are beginning to sound like Norman Shepard, who, as we all suspect, is only a few steps behind Greg Bonson. This is why neither of them teaches at Westminster. Like Hans Brinker, you are skating on thin ice. Watch out for Edmund Clowney and his blowtorch. Abandoning Machen's Legacy, Stage 2 Four decades after Kuiper's piece appeared, the Westminster Theological Journal published Edmund Clowney's article, quote, The Politics of the Kingdom, end quote. Kuiper had written, quote, Of all men, no one is more firmly convinced than the Calvinist that there can be no such thing as the salvation of society apart from the salvation of the individuals constituting society, dot, 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 end quote. But he had denied that this widespread salvation of souls will ever take place in history. Therefore, Society will not be saved, for example, healed. Clowney saw the implications of this statement, and he did not shrink from announcing them, although carefully shielding himself from critics by adopting the pejorative word, quote, sacralized, end quote, for the biblical word, quote, healed, end quote. Quote, the world cannot be sac sacralized by the fiat of the new theology to form the community of love Christ came to establish. The world lacks the new life of the Spirit, who sheds abroad the love of Christ in human hearts. It cannot be governed by the spiritual structure of Christ's kingdom, end quote. This shifts all of the Christian's con covenantal institutional concern to the church and away from politics. Note, whatever happened to the family? Quote, the politics of the kingdom demand that Christians take seriously the structure of the church 
as the form of the people of God on earth, end quote. In short, Clowney was preaching the non-politics of the kingdom, but a kingdom in history without civil sanctions is not a civilization. It is merely a ghetto. What Clowney was really preaching was the non-politics of the non-kingdom. This is tulip pietism. The sovereignty of a god without judicially predictable sanctions in history, this is predestined cultural impotence. Christians devoid of unique skills. He assured his readers that, quote, Christ has not promised to make us wise in world politics, skillful in technology, or talented in the arts, end quote. No? Then he has surely shortchanged his church, for this is exactly what he did for the Israelites as they fled from Egypt. He raised up Aholiab and Bezalel and endowed them with great technological skills so that they could carry out the building of the tabernacle. He also enabled them to teach others. But if one's vision for church history is a ceaseless wandering in the wilderness, a Christian ecclesiastical ghetto called the kingdom of God in history, then any suggestion of God's endowing his people with cultural talents implies his burdening them with cultural responsibility. This, above all, is what pietists resent and reject. So, they deny Christendom. Clowney, like all of his amillennial colleagues at Westminster, preached the hope of our future resurrection. What he and they never, ever preach is a theology of Jesus' past ascension. I can hardly overemphasize this. It is this implicit denial of the historic, cultural impact of Jesus' ascension that is at the very heart of their world view. Listen to Clowney's exhortation. Quote, the politics of the kingdom of heaven is the politics of faith, hope, and love. Faith that confesses the risen Savior. Hope that looks for His appearing. Love that is inflamed by His sacrifice on the cross. Only the realism of resurrection, hope, can sustain the Christian as a pilgrim traveling home. End quote. Here it is. Pietism with a vengeance. It is the pilgrim motif. A pilgrimage out of cultural responsibility in this world, not into it. It is a pilgrimage of suffering, not a pilgrimage of conquest. We supposedly never enter the promised land on earth and in history. Our marching orders are to march in circles until Jesus comes again. Quote, the heavenly community of Christ is called to an earthly pilgrimage. The people of God may not abandon the program of his kingdom. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified with him. Romans 8:18. 8, End quote. Nowhere in Clowney's theology is the intensely judicial doctrine of the Lord's Supper. Quote, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father had appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. End quote. Luke 22, 29 and 30. No. That office of judge is not what Clowney had in mind. Quote, the military and police power needed to maintain a political community in this world cannot be sought in Christ's name. End quote. It can't? To which theonomists ask, in whose name must it be sought? Silence. Endless self-conscious silence. Endless self-interested silence. And so we are back to square one covenantally. By what standard, in whose name, under whose authority, taking an oath to whom, there could be no neutrality. This is what Van Til taught. But Edmund Prosper Clowney was never a follower of Van Til. He was a defender, implicitly, but inescapably, of natural law theory. He insisted, quote, In judging the good or evil performance of the state, the Christian may not. However, judge the state as a form of the people of God, but only as an ordinance given to all men to preserve life. The distinction between the state as the form of the city of this world and the church as the form of the heavenly city remains essential. End quote. Redefining Kingdom and Church What part does the family play in all this? His words are clear. Quote, 
The church and only the church is established by Jesus Christ as the earthly form of the new and heavenly people of God. End quote. The theonomist asks, Is the family also only quote, an ordinance given to all men to preserve life? End quote? Clowney answers in the affirmative. Quote, the family remains as the institution of God for the propagation of life. Dot, 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 end quote. This is, of course, the old Roman Catholic definition of the family. Clowney's definition is self-consciously removed from the traditional Reformed emphasis on the family as the primary agency of dominion in history. It places Christian families outside the definition of the kingdom of God, i.e., it removes the family from the list of covenanted institutions. Only the church is lawfully a covenanted, oath-bound institution under Bible-revealed laws and sanctions. We must play, pay close attention to Clowney's use of, quote, body of Christ, end quote, the familiar definition of God's church and the kingdom of God in history. He winds up equating church and kingdom, and then he removes all traces of the kingdom from anything outside the institutional church. This is the standard pietist definition of church and kingdom. It has not been the historic Reformed definition. Substitute the word, quote, family, end quote, for, quote, state, end quote, in this sentence, and see what effect it has on the definition of the kingdom of God in history. Quote, to suppose that the body of Christ finds institutional expression in both the church and the state as religious and political spheres is to substitute a sociological conception of the church for the teaching of the New Testament. Dot, dot, dot. The church is the new nation, 1 Peter 2, nine, The new family of God, Ephesians 3.15. The theonomist asks, Does this mean that families are not to be judged in terms of biblical law? Does this mean that the laws of divorce are neutral, universal, and outside of biblical law's requirements? Does this mean that civil laws against polygamy are wrong? Does this mean that civil laws against sons marrying their widowed mothers are wrong? Clowney knows that this list of questions follows from his presentation, so he hurries to escape the obvious trap. He brings the family back into the kingdom, sort of. He asserts with no proof that, quote, the family, as a form of God's creation, is restored in relation to the church in a way that the state, an institution made necessary by the fall, is not, end quote. Yet he immediately insists, quote, in God's kingdom there is no restoration of creation, fulfillment of the ordinances of God for a fallen world, and anticipation of the new creation, end quote. So the state is not to be restored, but the family is. To which the theonomists say, this is a presupposition, not a conclusion, of pietism's rejection of the oath-bound legal status of the civil government. What we need is biblical evidence. He then writes, quote, Yet even the family is not identified with the new order of the kingdom, end quote. What does this mean? Exactly how is it different in this regard from the state? For that matter, how is it different from the church in this regard? Would any Reformed scholar argue that the institutional church is to be identified with the kingdom of God in history? None that I know of. Yet this is where Clowney's argument logically leads. But he is clever. He has read Voss. He knows that his identification of institutional church and kingdom is not a biblical argument. So he ends his discussion at this point. He moves on, leaving confusion in his wake. He has clearly and self-consciously broken with Voss's view of the kingdom, which he described in the final paragraph of his book on church and kingdom. Voss wrote, quote, Finally, the thought of the kingdom of God implies the subjection of the entire range of human life in all its forms and spheres to the ends of religion. The kingdom reminds us of the absoluteness, the pervasiveness, the unrestricted dominion, which of right belongs to all true religion. It proclaims that religion and religion alone can act as the supreme, unifying, centralizing factor in the life of man, as that which binds all together and perfects all by leading it to its final goal in the service of God. End quote. Van Til always said that he derived much of his theology from Voss. It is clear how Van Til could have come to his idea of the Christian's task of, quote, thinking God's thoughts after him, end quote, as a result of his exposure to Voss's concept of God's kingdom as implying, quote, 
the subjection of the entire range of human life in all its forms and spheres to the ends of religion, end quote. Voss made it clear that the kingdom of God in history encompasses everything. This is the kingdom of God on earth as civilization, as Christendom. It is the very antithesis of Edmund Clowney's narrow definition of God's earthly kingdom as the institutional church alone. Clowney had a different confession. He systematically reshaped Westminster Seminary to make it conform to his confession. Edmund Clowney rejected the Scottish Puritan view of the kingdom of God. What he taught was pietism. He taught what London Baptist Metropolitan Tabernacle pastor Peter Masters has preached. Masters proclaims the New Westminster's Confession, and for the same reasons. He, too, rejects the onomy. Quote, Reconstructionist writers all scorn the attitude of traditional evangelicals, end quote. Read, traditional pietists. Quote, who see the church as something so completely distinct and separate from the world that they seek no authority over the affairs of the world, end quote. No authority over the affairs of this world? These are the keys, key words. This is what Clowney seeks. This is what Masters seeks. This is what all pietists seek. This is what Westminster's Confession proclaims. In terms of its view of God's revealed law, Christian corporate responsibility, and the kingdom of God in history, theonomy, a reformed critique, is merely the Clowney Masters pietism writ large. By identifying the kingdom of God in history solely as the institutional church, Clowney and his disciples remove all other institutions from the required sanctions of biblical law. This is why they adopt these non-biblical, non-reformed definitions of both church and kingdom. They resent the sanctions associated with biblical law. They also resent the enormous, comprehensive cultural responsibility that is inescapably transferred to Christians by their grace-imparted legal status as saints in God's kingdom in history. Whose disciple was Edmund Clowney? He never said publicly, as far as I know. Nobody ever asked him to say. But the board rewrote the seminary's constitution and hired him to run it. And so Westminster abandoned Van Til's priceless legacy. Machen's legacy had been abandoned long before. A Wayfaring Stranger the hymn most consistent with Clowney's theology is not, quote, onward Christian soldiers, end quote. It is instead the traditional folk song of American pietism, quote, I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through this world of woe, end quote. Indeed he was, and he did not do a blessed thing to make this any less of a civil world of woe. He ridiculed as wrong-headed anyone who tries to work to improve civil affairs in the name of Jesus. For him, the kingdom of God is not a civilization. It is a lifeboat. He preached lifeboat theology and called it historic Calvinism. He preached the world view of the rescue mission and called it covenant theology. He not only abandoned Machen and Van Til, he even abandoned R.B. Kuyper. Kuyper said that we have been issued our marching orders Clowney dispersed the army, but invited these new civilians to come down to the cultural soup kitchens of life, to spend the whole of their lives ladling soup and handing out gospel tracts. I'm not even sure they were tulip tracts. He parroted in the name of Calvin the pietist theology that is the common gospel vision of our age. It is this that has produced the condition of the church that he lamented. Quote, Today the church stands not so much as an institution, as a ruin, end quote. The cause of this ruin is not the postmillennial vision of world conquest that the Puritans proclaimed, and the older Princeton, at least, whispered. Postmillennialism has not been the dominant eschatology of this century. The cause of this ruin is Clowney's anti-judicial theology, pietism. And when Norman Shepherd hinted ever so mildly that there is more to our marching orders than this, and hinted ever so mildly that postmillennialism is true, he got fired. Clowney then retired as president. Mission accomplished. Conclusion Abraham Kuyper was a late 19th century European conservative, a welfare state interventionist in the Bismarck tradition. His ideals are reminiscent of England's conservative leader, 
Joseph Chamberlain. Machen was a 19th century liberal in the tradition of Andrew Jackson, Grover Cleveland, and the pre-Bryan Democratic Party. He did not trust the state. Woolley was a 20th century liberal. Not only did he trust the state, he embraced it. His politics were the politics of Presbyterian Woodrow Wilson, not Presbyterian Grover Cleveland. R.B. Kuyper was vague about the ethical standards of the kingdom as civilization. Edmund Clowney was not vague. He denied the legitimacy of even a consideration of the kingdom as civilization. The kingdom of God in history is a ghetto, not a civilization, in Clowney's view. Kuyper, Machen, and Woolley came to their students in the name of Calvinism and Presbyterianism, just as Cleveland, Bryan, and Wilson came to the American electorate as both Presbyterians and Democrats. How could this be? Each man supposedly tied his ethics explicitly to the Bible. Each promoted his views in the name of Christianity. They did not agree on much of anything with respect to social ethics. Why such confusion? Because they did not say exactly where they had derived their social ethics. One thing is clear. None of them appealed directly to biblical texts, both Old and New Testaments. The theonomists do. This is their offense. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.